As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. 14. Well, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Be seated. And let's pray. Lord, I ask for your help as I preach this text. I would desire nothing more than to be found faithful with delivering what is here by inspiration. It's not here on accident or it's not a scribal error, but it is the very word of God. May these who hear and the first service, may they receive it as such for that it is. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We're back to this text of Scripture, and, you know, we've been working through Romans 9, just v verse and a few verses and a couple verses at a time, and, and Paul is teaching here, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> on God's exclusive right to ordain, on God's exclusivity to make selections, on God's right to choose I don't know what Bible <clears throat> version you use, but typically English translations in the heading of a section will provide some phrases or words. And in the ESV, it is encapsulated in three words, God's sovereign choice. Paul is showing how does the gospel apply to real people Paul is showing how the actual gospel extends and works or is efficient in the lives upon whom it impacts. In chapter 1, Paul said there that the gospel was dynamous. It was the power of God unto salvation. Well, we're continuing to see how does this work from not only the fact of the fall, not only from the fact of man's um, uh, deplorable status as sinners to how is man regenerated? What are the benefits of the believers? We get back to chapters 9, 10, and 11, which answers the question, what about Israel? What is God doing with them? Has God failed with them? And not only does it extend to Israel, but they are the, 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 the close context here, but it also extends outward to how does any believer ultimately come to its, his or her belief? So let's recall just a few things, if I, if I can. Remember that as I joined verse 13 to the text of today's focus, we see there that very powerful phrasing in the English language, which has those words in distinction of love and hate. And human hate is one thing and divine hate is another. And it is not easy for us to wrap our finite heads around such concepts and words like these. You might recall that case evidence brought forth in the scripture was God's sovereign right to choose. And the first person was it was Abraham, that God chose Abraham. He didn't choose others. He chose Abraham. And then Abraham would have offspring and Abraham would have two sons. And these were brought forth as examples. And in these two sons, there were two separated by some 12 years or so. And one son, the first son was Ishmael. That son was not chosen but the later son was chosen. That son was Isaac. One chosen, one not. One elected, one not elected. And then the case moves into the next uh, division down or the next bracket down, the next tree branch down. And we cite the offspring of Isaac. And Isaac will have children, this time not separated by 12 years, this time not joined and birthed by two separate mothers with an interval in between. No, by the same mom at the same moment of concession, in the same womb space, in the same amniotic flood, at the same type of delivery, in the same swaddling cloths, and God's elected one and not the other. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. This is consistent with what we have seen so far. And all this, the text says that God did before the infants had made any choice, before God saw something that they might do, God sovereignly chose. Why did he choose? The text says earlier, 
according to the counsel of God's will, according to the fact and the reality and the purposes of election that they might stand, Paul's language. I said last week of God's sovereignty and choosing, I said there were three features of that of which we should be incredibly grateful. And those three, just by way of summation, I said that God's sovereignty is inscrutable. It's inscrutable. There are things that we call the hidden will of God, and there's what we call the revealed will. And both are still inscrutable. One, he just condescends to show you. This is the revealed will. The hidden will, we know nothing about, except that it's hidden. I talked about God's sovereignty, that it was inscrutable, but it's also essential. It is the way, it is our hope. It is our per understanding that there would be no one saved without God's sovereignty having this essentiality as a feature in the core and in the main and then I said of God's sovereignty that it was inscrutable, it was essential, and thankfully it is what? Comprehensive. Everything is accounted for. Events, people, actions, even evil. Even evil is accounted for in the plan of God. Now, as we move into this body of text, as we have been here for some three weeks, I want to give you three words that comprise how many people have found a section like this and other sections related to this, how they have found a kind of maybe discomfort or friction that has not been uncomplicated. And so some people have viewed the doctrines that emanate or present from this chapter in Romans 9, they have found themselves to have allergies towards it. They don't like it. Um, their body doesn't respond well to it. They sneeze. They break out in boils. They don't like it. They have allergies towards it. But they still live. They're fine. Others people do not have allergies, but towards the doctrines here, they have what I would call animus. They have great disdain for it. They have a great hatred for it, a great dislike for it. It's very unsettling. It's very concerning to that person. So some have allergies, some have animus, and yet others have what I will go and say, have simple acceptance. They accept the doctrines because they are in the text of Holy Scripture. Where are you? I don't know. I'm certain in rooms of, of, of a congregation that has two services that there are people that are on all sides of this. Some accept, some have animus, and some have allergies. Here's how I know that that that, uh, that that I said is true because I talked to you. Here's how I also know that is true, which is even more meaningful than what I just said because my experience doesn't mean, mean Scripture has Scripture. Scripture is Scripture. And what does Paul say in the Scripture? Paul knew that people wouldn't like it because of verse 14. And verse 14 says, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Paul anticipates because he's already experienced that people do not like the, this doctrine. They do not process it well. They bring to this passage bias and human understanding and meaning to try to make the Scripture say something else. Even maybe a, a, an academic kind of gymnastics are deployed to try to make it not say what it says. You know that this is true because Paul says it. And Paul asks a question here. Verse 14 says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. Three phrases comprise verse 14. That phrase there, and the early part, phrase A, if you want to look at that, A, that question form, what shall we say then? That is used in the Bible. That phrase used in the Bible, in the Greek, appears seven times. That phrase appearing some seven times appears in the New Testament in one book. And so if it appears in one book, which book do you think it is? Let's see who's listening. If it appears in Romans and it appears only in one book, what book do the seven appearances appear in? In Romans by Paul. And so that phrase, Paul asks, because the natural question is leading to a natural answer, which Paul always provides that answer. And what is the answer he says? 
to, is there in just on God's part? What does he say? By no means. That's always the natural answer that should result. So there are people who are deducting from what Paul has said, and they're drawing a doctrine. They're drawing a conclusion that Paul needs to correct. He wants to make sure that they're operating properly upon the right foundation. That's what he says there. The negative answer is required to this, what shall we say then? It's always that required. Again, because false conclusions are natural, false conclusions are easy. Why I'm clapping, I don't know. I don't know. The word injustice in your Bible, that's the word, injustice. Is there injustice on God's part? Now, we have words that we change their meaning by making them compounds, or we have words and or we have words where we can add suffixes, which is an end, or we can append the word by adding a prefix. And so if I read some words with prefixes attended, you will know the meaning by the inverse. Listen to see if this test of mine and this thought is true. Unrighteousness. You immediately know what that means by striking the prefix, don't you? Unjust, you know what remains if you take off the un. I can say a word like unfair. Some of you who have parented children or you have heard someone say this is, if they think something is not equitable, they would say it's what kind of fair? It's not fair. Unfair, not fair. You take off the first, you are left with the other. Unjust. Remove the prefix in and you have just. These are all conveying the same meaning as regards concepts. Now, we're familiar with the positive aspect because we add the prefix to the root. So we know what the positive aspect is of these words in these forms. And in the Greek, the positive word for justice or justify and the cognates therein, we can think in the most simple base form as dikaio. Dikaio, that is righteousness. That is justice. That is, if I can use a softer word, which is not necessarily always appropriate, it is fair. I, I, I use that in the, in the tertiary way. But think more of justice or righteousness. That's dikaio. But in the negative, or when we want to add something that is in the negation or the absence of something, we add a simple phrase from the R -E alphabet to the Greek form, and in negation is formed by adding what letter? An A, ah, an A. And so then injustice is simply just the negation of justice by saying ah justice, ah righteousness. And that word is adikie. And that's the word for injustice. Now, I labor that for you because Paul wants to make sure that you understand these concepts of justice and injustice. Now, I'm going to flesh that out here again in just a minute, but that will be suffice for now. Let me ask you a question early on. Do you think that the God of the cosmos, who's made everything, the God of the cosmos who called life into being as he ordered the cosmos and the universe. Do you think that that God, Yahweh, Elohim, do you think that the creator God, the God of all, do you think that God can display injustice? Answer that question. Do you think God is capable of displaying injustice. You have to, if you have a concept of God properly, you have to say, absolutely not. He can't do it. You're right. And you would be well, well versed to ground that answer as such. But let me ask a different organ of your body the same question. I asked you to consider that and I asked that in your head and thinking, but how does your heart reply? How does your heart reply to, is there injustice on God's part? Now, there you might have a rub, won't you? Because there's something about hearing a verse like verse 13. There's something like reading a passage like verse 15 that, that, that in your heart, it's like, I, I don't like that. It doesn't seem right. It, it, I don't, I, I'm not comforted by that. 
I don't know how that is possible. That, that can't be the possible meaning. So our head can lead us to, to one kind of idea or conception, and yet our heart might lead us to another. And, and I, I want to remind you and, and just tell you again, I understand. Paul understands, which is why we spend this time in the Holy Scripture. No, God cannot be guilty of an injustice. Paul says, by no means. Of course not. Of course God hasn't failed. Of course the Jews that God intends to save, they will be saved. Because the Jews that God has intended to save, He will save the Jew He intended to save. I didn't fail. No, God hasn't failed. Now before I do something atypical, I want to include and read first verse 15. Because I will cover all this together, in, in, again, in, in an atypical way, but I think you will respect it and you will find it useful. Let me bring to you heart and mind and your eyes and ears. Verse 15. We move from the case example of Abraham and his kids. We move beyond uh, Isaac's kids with Jacob and Esau. Right? We can see that. Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. Now, another evidence of individual is brought forth in Moses. And, and what Paul says here, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Mercy and compassion are related in the Greek, uh, but, they, but, but it's simply a recapitulation just to help process the depth and, 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 and the, the, the import of what Paul is pressing here. And this time is a reference back to the Old Testament again when God has converse or concourse as he speaks and he intercedes at Sinai with Moses. With Moses. This is down the path from Jacob. This is even further down the path. And others that will come down the path after even Moses. And again, this, this whole statement, verse 15, if you will grant it, which I know you will, verse 15 is not any softer to hear or to read than verse 14. Or verse 13, rather, right? Verse 13 and verse 15 are just as forceful. And not, not one of them is, is more comforting, if I, I want to use that word. They're both as forceful and meaningful. This passage to, to, to capture here is really looking back to the Old Testament when Moses is at Sinai, Exodus chapter 33. And in Exodus 33, 19, Paul is simply just restating what is there. And there is, is Moses. Moses will be the one to receive the Sinaitic Code. Moses will receive the Ten Commandments. Moses will, will speak with God. Moses will hear God. Moses will be shielded by God. Moses here has the audacity or the boldness or the power or the temerity to even question God. And he does question God. And God condescends to answer him. And God answers him. And what does God say? I will make all my goodness to pass before you and to proclaim me before your name. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I show mercy to. God wasn't obligated to show anything to Moses, and yet he kept him alive. Elsewhere in the Scripture, the Old Testament, we know that no one could see God and live. And a fact of mercy is that God would even talk to Moses and let him live, and God shields him. He shows him mercy. He has dialogue with this Moses. And this is what Paul cites as evidence of God's sovereign right to choose. And here it involves mercy, compassion. Now, again, to teach this body of content, I want to do something unlike what most of you are used to. And I want to revisit concepts that I've revealed before, I've taught before, I've asked you to take notes on before, and I would ask you to continue to take notes. We at The Rock like to learn, we like to study, because studying in the mind informs the heart, and a heart inflamed wants to study more of God. And so this circuitous path brings us to beauty and power of the Scripture. So today I'm going to give you another opportunity to teach, but I'm going to teach in a little different method. But first, because I want to lay this foundation, I want to quote two, and only two verses. I could marshal a legion of them, but I don't have 90 minutes. So I'm going to pick two 
for your foundational laying on the ground first. And that is, that is number one. The first passage from the very book of Paul, so we stay in the context, came from Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 is in the heading of your Bibles, like mine, it says no, or no one is righteous. All that verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, that's all people, all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Now verse 10. Notice it very quickly. This is foundational verse. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. There's the universal condition of all men. All men. All women. This is them. This is us. All of us. So that's verse 1 to add. And yet, the Johannian gospel in the third chapter says what you have seen repeated or displayed on banners, on bumpers of cars, on the side of maybe, maybe someone wanted to use it as graffiti, maybe under someone's eyeball, on their face with black ink. John 3.16, which also must be held in as equal beauty and power as any other passage we can see, right? Yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have every, every turn, everlasting or eternal life, the passage says. So we have two verses of this love of God, and I praise God for this. I love this passage so much. And there's other verses just like this, and they're meaningful. But if you were listening to Paul's words and you're listening to Jesus' words, Deals are both in the holy canon of Scripture. But what immediately presents is that we now have, my friends, a word that's fancy that starts with a Q. And that word is we have a quandary. Why do we have a quandary? Because who are the people that, who are the whosoever? Who are the whosoever's that are, don't exist? How is someone to, to respond to the gospel that is preached? So we have the reality that man is this, but Jesus says, whoever believes. So then, how, then who are these people? Who are the whosoever's? I'm going to answer that for you because Paul answers it. How can there be whosoever's when none seek? You must get this right because if you don't get this right, then everything else gets off. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to use some graphics that I think it will help. And not only what I, am I going to use some graphics, I'm going to use this laser pointer. And it has a laser. Let's make sure it's working. Yet, No, it's not working. Darn it. That's okay. So what I'm going to... Mike, are we good? Are we live? Oh, there we go. Okay. The, the laser is now working. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this laser very specifically, and I want you to all keep your eyes open. And I'm going to I have a goal. I'm going to, I'm going to jab each one of you with the laser in your eye. Do not shut your eye. Before the end of the service, I will make sure everybody has this laser hit their eye. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use it to advance some slides. But I want us to be, pay very special attention. Let's introduce the, the body of the question here again, first in Romans chapter 9. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Is there adikaio, adikiai? Is there this kind of lack of right? Is there, is God not fair? That's the question. So here's the reality. We know that the gospel gets preached to the whole world. The gospel gets preached to the whole world. This is the command of Scripture. Why do we preach to the whole world, people? Because God commands it. Do you need a different reason? No. That's a sufficient reason, wouldn't you say? So we preach to everybody. You see here in my representation, I have a globe. I have people just, just representing people in their various places. So the gospel gets preached to the whole world. 2 Peter chapter 3 says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's from the mouth of Peter. The other scriptures that are again reinforcing, again, I can marshal many like this, is the very next verse from John 3.16 is the 17th verse. See how neat the scripture does that? 17 follows 16. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, who's the him? Jesus, that the world might be saved. So again, we see this. 
But we understand that, okay, but we know some people who don't believe. How many of you know people that don't believe? We all do. Ever asked why you believe and someone else doesn't? So the gospel gets preached to the, the whole world. And it's an indiscriminate preaching. Indiscriminate in preaching. But again, I have to ask you the question because if you're following along in the whole scripture, you have to come to this deduction to draw. But who will respond? Who can respond? Who will believe then? Because the scripture says, again, we were dead in trespasses and sins. I have not met yet. If any of you have met him, please introduce me to him or her. I have not met anybody yet who I can carry on conversation with or share the gospel with who's dead and who has responded. You were dead in trespasses and sin. Further showing the quandary. Genesis chapter 6, which is around the time of the flood, where the entirety of mankind, save eight people, when eight were elected, when, when eight were selected or elected for salvation, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great and every intention of his heart was only wicked. And then John chapter 6, in that passage that divided people, the people fled from Jesus, when Jesus himself lays out a doctrine where he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So again, we have the power of John 3.16. We have the power of the gospel, chapter 1, verse 16. And yet we have the reality of other places and like this where we continue to see the thrust of preaching. And yet we also see the reality of the fallenness of man with inability to choose. So who chooses? Who's the whosoever? So what does the scripture do? The scripture speaks of election. Again, some of us, that's that word that we have an allergen to. Fine, don't like the word election, but then choose a, a different word for it. Choose selection. Selection has the same meaning. And what does the doctrine of election say? The doctrine of election says God elects, God chooses sovereignly, and he does so out of a mass of fallen humans. There's no human anywhere on the face of the earth that is innocent. None, not one. All are out of the mass, the bulk of fallenness. And that what does God do? He sees that reality and he elects, he selects some and those that he elects, he does so based on nothing meritorious, nothing in them, nothing beautiful, nothing powerful, nothing of value. He sees nothing in them except their sin. Because that, why? They are fallen. And so then, as God in the doctrine of election is choosing those he elects, those he selects, those he sovereignly chooses, Israel, for example, as the case shows forth, Israel is recipients or are recipients of grace. That's what election does, is it brings forth grace. So that's what Paul is saying. Now, we haven't used this word in the last few weeks, but if we have a word like election, then naturally we draw a secondary word, which is related. And the counterpart word to election is not deselection, it is reprobation reprobation. This is the counterpart to election. And in election, or in reprobation, God is not arbitrary in his, in his electing. It's not unfair. God is not saying, you'll be better, you'll be bad, you'll be great, you'll be popular, you'll be effective, you'll be worthless, you'll be uh, disgusting to me, you'll embarrass me, you'll make me pri proud, and all on the positive get elected, and those who are doing poorly or won't do well, they get reprobated. No. Remember, we're all of the mass of fallen humanity. And in the act of election, which has the counterpart, reprobation, you can't take reprobation away from election. The one has its as the counterpart, the other. And what do we know? That God retains his holy and his glorious nature in this process. That's why Paul says in the emphatic, by no means is God unjust. 
And so then, if the elect get grace, those not elected, what do they get? Justice. Is it wrong for God, as this divine magistrate of all the cosmos, is it wrong for God to give some justice? No. If you had a family member who was murdered, murdered, and it was caught on tape, and there were evidences of, 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 of eyewitnesses, and, and, and it was recorded on, on, on television, and, 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 the, and the manifold examples were everywhere there, would, what, would you want the judge to be just? You would want the, just, the judge to be just. That's what reprobation is. It's just saying they get justice. It's not wrong. Now, that's a powerful illustration, and I hope that never happens to any of us. But this is the counterpart. So then here's the two questions that are in, in the passage, and I, I bring them to you just as modified questions. Verse 14, is there injustice on God's part when he elects? That's, that's what's implied. Does God have to show mercy to everybody? Verse 15. So then I ask another follow-up question. What is God capable of displaying? In other words, what is consistent with God's nature? What is consistent with God's nature? In other words, the greater question, which is on your and my minds, is God fair? Is God fair? Well, for what I will do next, I will borrow from this that was taught to me by Dr. Sproul. And he does this very, very, very well. And so I, I can take no credit for it, but I think it's very helpful. And so what we must understand first is terms like justice, that word in the Greek, which is here translated in the English language for that word. And justice is equivalent to righteousness in a sense. And in actuality, God's nature shows forth and brings forth that he shows and displays justice. This is also known as righteousness. This is what God's nature does. It brings forth justice. This is in God. Justice. This is a concept. And so if we have that circle and inside is justice, then that means we have something outside of that, don't we? On the outside of justice, we have something else. We have another category. We have one category in the middle, another category on the outside. And the outside category is non-justice. So as a concept, we have justice or righteousness in the middle. Then on the outside, we have non-justice. And that's everything, another concept known as non-justice. And so everything in the middle is comprised of the category of justice or righteousness. Everything outside of that is called non-justice. But we cannot stop here with this diagram. This would be, not be suffice to bring out the full meaning of teaching because we have another division. We have another breakdown or, or we have to bifurcate that outer circle in two. And so the way we do that is by showing the two kinds of non-justice. Follow with me here. The concept in the middle is justice, right? Righteousness. Everyone sees that. But now we have two kinds of non-justice. And this kind of distinction has salvific import. This is where the rubber meets the road. And the first kind on the top of non-justice is known as what? I didn't hear you all. What is it called? Grace. Grace, Grace is a kind of non-justice. The very definitions of grace and justice imply such. Justice is required. It is, it is due according to actions. Grace is not required. It is also known as mercy, and mercy is never required. If you make grace or mercy a requirement, you've just chosen a different word. It can't be deserved if it's grace. And so then, if we have justice and grace, then we have one other kind, don't we? And what is that called? Injustice. And what does Paul say in the text of Romans 9? Is there injustice on God's part? Paul knows about grace. 
Paul knows about justice. Some people know about grace and justice. Some people confuse injustice, which is why the question comes forward. Now, as we continue this, I ask you again, what type of non-justice is God incapable of showing to any of His creation? You know the answer. Because categorically, grace is related to election. And categorically, injustice is related to unrighteousness and or evil. How many of you think God is capable of evil? Anyone want to raise a hand? No. So you know, of course, why Paul says emphatically, by no means can God show injustice. Because God is not evil. God cannot be unrighteous. So that leaves us the two categories only that God can show you, doesn't it? And so what that means is really quite simple that those God chooses, it's by grace, and that's called election. And they were chosen because of nothing in them. Because God decided to show cosmic or divine clemency to them. That's what he did. And what did the rest get? What we, what we deserved. Justice. They get reprobation. Paul says, is there injustice when God does that? Well, God can't do that. Now, see, this is not easy. This is not uncomplicated. But we're back to the teaching of Scripture. And verse 13 says, Jacob I've loved, but Esau I hated. This goes back to Isaac. This goes back to Jacob. This goes back to Abraham. God has a sovereign right to choose out of a mass of fallen humanity what he will do and for what purposes. So the purposes of election might stand. That's verse 11. You know, this morning, I recognize this is not always easy. I know that God is not required to show me anything. Have you, are you at that point yet? Where you recognize that God's not obligated to show you a thing? Because we're, 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 we're God's enemies. We're sinners. And when you think God needs to show everybody grace, you've lost the meaning of grace. You've lost the meaning and the concept of justice. How many of you remember pinball tables? Or Remember that? Remember the little ball, the steely, was always fun? What happened if you were overly aggressive on the table? What would happen? Tilt. Why do you know that word? Because, it, because saying something is wrong. In your mind, whenever you cry unfair to this doctrine, in your head, a tilt indicator should go off. That you've changed the word grace to mean something that it doesn't mean. Because grace is undeserved. Justice is always deserved. I will lay my cards on the table with you here, and as if this is a secret, and say I completely side with Spurgeon, who sides with Luther, Luther, who sides with Calvin, who sides with Augustine, who sides with Aquinas, who sides with the bulk of all of the doctrines of grace, who sides with Jesus Christ, who say that I'm not bothered by the fact that God has hatred for Esau. I'm not bothered by that in the least. What I'm bothered by is that God loves anybody. That's what bothers me. That's what I don't like. Because I know me. I know my sinfulness. I know what I deserve. So I don't worry about who, who God hates. I don't know who God has selected. I preach to everybody because that's what we do. That's what you do. You leave the secret things to God. You preach to everybody. Again, I have no problem with, with God showing mercy to some. I'm, I'm surprised why He just, just, just showed justice to everybody. That's what we deserve. Well, in verse 16, and I'll just, I'll just make this in brief, and then I'm gonna, I have to close because we're almost out of time. Verse 16 just kind of builds upon this by that difficult passage here where he goes back to show how what it was said earlier in the first four verses. He says, So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but it depends on God who has mercy. It depends on God who shows grace. Does it say, it says your, your choice doesn't matter. You, you exerting, putting forth energy doesn't matter. It, it, what matters is God choosing. Paul goes back to the point evidencing Jacob and Esau by showing the cause, not the effect of Jacob's salvation. It was God. It was mercy. Well, 
you may ask here, why are we spending so much time on this doctrine? Can't we just move on from election? I hate this passage. You might hate it. I get it. But if I don't preach this doctrine, then I'm not fair to Scripture because the Scripture has this passage in here. And I'm not on some vendetta looking to preach this every time I have a chance. I preach what's in the Scripture when it's in the Scripture. Plain and simple. It's here in the Scripture. Can't avoid it. So here are some final takeaways in our time together. Four of them. Election is sinful man's hope. Election is sinful man's hope because we're all fallen humanity. And none of us are going to come to God unless He chooses us. We're not going to come. And so then the inverse is reprobation is sinful man's punishment. Plain and simple. It's not unfair. It's not unjust. It's justice. Similarly, election doesn't reward future merit. Election doesn't see anything good in the future in us. It only sees more demerit. That's a fact. That's not why God chooses us because He thinks we'll be swell and heaven will be a better place if we're there. And the inverse is equally true. Reprobation isn't punishing present demerit because we all have demerit. Every one of us. My friends, I deeply appreciate your patience. I know this is, 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 is hard. In Romans 8, we were, as Ross Logan said, we were in high cotton. Romans 9, kind of a barren landscape. But it's a beautiful landscape because there's no hope outside of it. Because men who are dead don't choose a Savior who saves. This morning, I want you to use this week to contemplate that God would love any of us. Don't mind yourself with who has God elected, who has God chosen. You're not going to know that. I'm not going to know that. How about instead you preach the gospel to everybody and let God sort it out. Let God sort it out. He knows those who are His, the Scripture says. So preach to everybody. And may God get the glory. And may you, if God has called you, rest in that. And you, if you here today have never trusted in Christ Jesus and you want to come to Christ, equally you can know that if you want Him, He's yours to be had. You can come to Him and He will turn away none. And that's the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May He be glorified and may you be comforted this morning. Let's pray.